Go ahead and turn to John chapter 4, please. Once upon a time, I was a store manager for McDonald's. True story, I have on my wall in my office a bachelor degree of hamburgerology from Hamburger University. It's not a joke. It's there, back right in there. You can go look at it. Um, and I remember the, the summer of 1994. Um, I, was, I was working late at night on a weekend, and Norm from Cheers came through our drive through and ordered a hot fudge sundae. And I missed it. I was, in a, I, was in, I was in a different part of the store. I was doing inventory or something. And I missed it. And I, so I come back in the front probably 10 minutes later after it happened. And everyone is all excited. And I had no clue what they were excited about. I told them to get back to work. And they said, but Chris, Norm just came through the drive-thru. So I, I, went, I went to high school with a guy named Norm, who was a great basketball player. Um, and so I just like, so Norm came through the drive-thru, no big deal. No, 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 you don't get it. Norm from Cheers came through the drive-thru. And so I, I understood why everyone was excited. Uh, there, there are other times in our lives where we miss things that are good things because we were out doing something that we thought was much more important. And we miss, we miss, um, we, sometimes we just get too busy with other things that we miss, we miss some of the most important things. We're going to see that a little bit in John chapter 4 today. Many of you know this story. Jesus and the woman at the well. Um, if, if you're familiar with the story, raise your hand. I'm going to put a little twist on it. Because that's what happens sometimes when there are familiar stories in the Bible. Uh, we think, oh, we know that. We've learned everything that we need to learn about that particular passage. But um, there's always something more that we can learn about the passage. So I want us to, I want us to just to look we're going to look at, uh, the, the woman at the wall actually says five different things to Jesus. And so we're going to talk about those five little things uh, a little bit today. Let me pray and then we'll, we'll jump in. God, thanks for today. Thanks for uh, the word of God being true and being real and always being teachable for our lives. Um, God, we ask that um, you would open our eyes to see what you have to say to us today. God, transform us into, into the, uh, the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Um, encourage us, refresh us this morning through the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to see this this morning. Um, compassion-filled conversations. Those who know me well know I'm not so good at that all, all the time. Anybody with me? Some, some. Compassion-filled conversations allow believers to have gospel-pointed conversations. Uh, meaning this, if you, if you want to just get to the gospel and you don't really ever care about the person that you're talking to, you're never going get to get to the gospel. They're not going to stick around long enough. And so this conversation with, with Jesus and the woman at the well Jesus uh, sticks around long enough to get to the, to get to the goods. So they, they talk about some very menial, very elementary things in order to get to where Jesus wants to go in this conversation. But it takes patience and compassion along the way. Let me, let me read verse 1. It says this, chapter 4, Therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees has heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. He left Judea and departed into Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. 
on the surface, that probably means nothing. That's like, hey, I went to Ann Arbor and had to go through Saline to get there. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Joseph's, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, thus sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Immediately, there are introduced into this chapter four different groups of people. A couple very clear and some not so clear. One, Jesus. Clear, Jesus is one of the main characters in this chapter. The woman at the well is also a main character in this chapter. We have the disciples. They went off and got food. They come up. They show up again later. And then there is this other group of people that uh, aren't clearly referenced, but we know they're there. We know they're there because um, he, Jesus sits by the well about the sixth hour and a lady comes to get water. The sixth hour is about noon. So let's just picture here a July, a hot July afternoon. Where do you want to be in a hot July afternoon? In your pool, in your living room, where there's air conditioning, somewhere. You're not walking out to the well, outside the city gates, to the well with your buckets and the work that it takes to go get the water, you're not doing that at noon. You want to do that at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., before the heat of the day. Some of you I know aren't up that early in the morning. Just go with me. It's really a nice time of day. You want to go get to the well and get water before it gets hot because you don't want to work during the heat of the day. I, on the other hand, will go run four or five miles in the heat of the day in July. It's no big deal. So I could go get that water. I understand there are people that, do, that don't want to do that. So there is the, the unsaid group of people is the people that drove her to go to the well at that time. There is, there is a group of people. For whatever reason, if she went to, that, if she went to the well... At 8 o'clock in the morning, she would see other people there that she doesn't want to see. And so she goes when nobody's at the well. So let's just understand for a minute that we can be those people. If we're not looking for compassion-filled conversations, the opposite is a conversation that's going to, draw, that's going to force someone to go to a well when we're not there. If you used to have a conversation with someone that uh, no longer comes around you, it's a good chance that you need growth in the area of compassion-filled conversations. Can I get an amen? I'm with you. So our first point, I'm going to point some pictures out to you, but I want you to see this. Sin always prevents God's people from reaching our highest influence. The, the little line in this that I glazed over, but he needed to go through Samaria, uh, is significant when I show you the maps I'm about to show you. And I hope they're big enough that you can see, at least get a glimpse of them. Sin always prevents God's people from reaching our highest influence. Screen here to your, to, uh, your left, my right, is when the nation of Israel were going, they were going out to the promised land, that is the territory that God said you get. Twelve tribes, you get all of your land. I want you to notice the orange part. The orange part says Manasseh. 
Uh, Manasseh was one of Joseph's children. Manasseh and Ephraim. Joseph was so special in God's eyes and Jacob's eyes that his, he, there were two tribes allotted to Joseph's family. Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, the picture on the the picture on your the other picture is the green. So keep an eye, just focus on the green. Um, after David was king, after Solomon was king, uh, Solomon's son was uh, exhibited poor leadership, and uh, most of Israel said, "We have no part in you. We're going to go form our own thing." Church split. Um, the nation of Israel split, so now there is there are ten tribes, the northern tribe, and the southern tribe, Judah, where Jerusalem is. Where where does so talk back to me, where does Manasseh fall? Alright. The green or the orange? The green. Okay, so Manasseh is in the green, the northern tribes. The, the picture on your left, I, I want you to notice where Samaria is. All right, if you're online, I'm going off screen for a moment. Okay, Sychar right here, this is where it happens. This is where Samaria is. This is where Manasseh was. If you read the prophets and you see Israel, um, where you see in like Ezekiel, or if you read Isaiah, you read where it's Israel, you'll see Israel and you'll see Judah. Israel in the Old Testament is where Samaria currently is in this picture. And then you can read the, the next one is what modern day uh, Israel looks like. And I show you that because... This was the promised land. This is what Israel, what God said, I will give you. This is everything. This is your highest potential right here. Sin split it into two. Uh, Rebellion and sin again, going against God's command, leads part of what Israel was to Samaria, a land that the Jews hated. Uh, They hated because they hated it because the, this, this part of the world began to marry non-Jewish people. And so they were understood to be cross-cultural marriages and they were condemned. And, and so again, over and over, sin prevented God's people from reaching their highest influence. Over and over and over to the point of we were once the same as you. And because of our sin and rebellion, now we're hated by you. So much so that if if people wanted to go from Judea to Galilee, they would go all they would go through Decapolis and they would go around. They didn't even want to, they hated them so much, they didn't even want to go into Samaria. Sin always prevents God's people from reaching our highest influence. Always. Let me point out one more thing. This is the desktop on my computer. Uh, Every time I, every time I, if I have nothing open, every time, every day I log in, I look at these words. Surround your people that talk about visions and ideas, not other people. Because the people that drove her at the well at that time can very easily be you and me. And, and if you are, I'll come back to that. If if. If sin always prevents God's people from reaching our highest influence in other people, what I say about other people, what I say about other people can, re- can prevent me from reaching my highest influence. There is a woman that we're going to talk about in the coming verses 
that goes to the well at noon when nobody else is there. There is somebody in that community that is talking poorly about her. That is holding her back. That is holding their community back. And I want to just lovingly, I want to say this. If you are a person that talks about other people, you are preventing your, you are preventing your own life and your family's life from reaching the highest influence that God has for you. If, if you have a habit of talking about other people, you are in rebellion and you need, a, you need a gut check in front of God. It's sin, and I think it's important that we call it sin. Because there's this conversation uh, that happens. And quite frankly, this, na- this lady needs to recover. She made some really poor choices. And there are people that we know that would say, she made poor choices. She deserves to be talked poorly about. No, she doesn't. Compassion-filled conversations allow believers gospel-pointed conversations. Even if this, even if she cooked her own goose, even if she dug her own hole and got in and buried it, she doesn't deserve to be talked poorly. Talked about poorly. Never. Okay, so let's go to verse 9. She has five, five statements uh, with, with Jesus that I think are actually really questions. So verse 9. Uh, verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Notice the disciples missed the whole thing. The disciples were too busy taking care of what they thought was important. They missed all of it. Verse 9, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is to you give me a drink, you would have asked me, and he would have given you living water. First question. First statement, first question. I don't deserve for you to treat me kindly. What is it? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Um... Why are you talking to me? Now, uh, we need to understand in the New Testament culture, women were, women were property. Women had no vote. They could not buy property. They were, they were the husband's property. And they would stay home and they would take care of the house and they would, they would, do, they would uh, manage the household. They were just above servants or slaves. They were more dignified. But the men would just go out and do their thing. And when they came home, they would expect everything to be done just like they wanted it to be, or they could be angry. Um, Thank God that we don't live in the New Testament culture. If Guys, if you are a, a guy that treats a woman like that, you should just spend some time in Ephesians. Because women deserve more than that. They are God's creation and we have to treat them like God's creation. I don't deserve for you to treat me kindly. Why are you talking to me? Jesus said, "Um, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him uh, and he would have given you a drink. Here's, I think Jesus' response is this. If you understood who I am, you would have begun the conversation. I I don't deserve for you to treat me kindly. Why are you talking to me? And Jesus says, "Uh, if you knew who I was, you would have come up to me and you would have started the conversation. And sometimes I think that this fits into our lives more than we would like to admit. Sometimes I think that we we, uh, sit and we're sulking in our own little mess that we've made 
We're like, God, I don't deserve, I don't deserve you to be kind to me at all, which we don't. The grace of God is the only thing that uh, allows, it, allows us to receive the kindness of God. And, but we want to know, God, why do you waste your time talking to me? All of us have had that at one point or another. And I want, and I want just to reinforce that Jesus never is wasting time when He's talking to us. Jesus is never wasting His time when He's pursuing us. Jesus is never wasting His time with handing us the gift of God that He has given into our lives. And so she finds out very quickly, uh, really, is it safe? Is this a safe conversation? And she finds out very quickly, yes, this is a safe conversation. And Jesus has to give compassion over and over and over because this lady has been burnt relationally over and over and over again. She just wants to know, is this, is this safe space? Here's the question. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. She is really good at stating the obvious. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus, I have quite the past. Are you more influential than my history? I have quite the past. I have quite the past. I have been preserved by the grace of God from a lot of things, but I have a past. I have a before Jesus past. And you have a before Jesus past. Whether you are retired or whether you are a teenager or a preteen or anywhere in between, you have a past. And Satan's goal in life is to convince us that our past is more influential than anything that Jesus has to offer. Here's Jesus' answer. Verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. This water, the well. But whoever drinks of this shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Yes, you have a past. Yes, you have a past. And your past makes you come to this well every day at noon when it's hot to get water that is evaporating while you get it. I can give you water. I can give you water that will make you never thirst. I can give you water that will be a fountain of spring, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Yes, you have a past. My influence is greater than your past. And it will satisfy your life forever. See, once, once she understands it's a safe conversation that she can have, Jesus can start leading into a direction of the things that you're searching for will only last for a little while. When you allow my influence to come into your lives, those things will last forever. Longer, longer than Jacob's well. That was way back in the first picture. Longer than Jacob's well. Longer than my lifetime. Longer than the legacy that your favorite grandparent left. Longer, longer than anything. The, the influence that Jesus 
puts on our lives will satisfy us in a way that we will never thirst or search. We've found the answer. Here's the next one. 15. The woman said to him, because, you know, someone that walks into, walks into church and they're, they're not quite, um, they don't know the protocols of church, or they walk into church for a first time and they don't understand even where to go. Where do I find coffee? Where are the restrooms? Um, or what's this, why do you put money into an offering plate? What's this Jesus that you talk about? All of it. People that never attend church before don't understand any of those things. And we, um, we as long-term church-attending Americans just think people get it. We just think if someone walks into this building, they understand. Like it's magic. You walked into our building, so you automatically know where everything is and what you're supposed to do. And so she says, uh, verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She doesn't get it. She doesn't understand. It needs to be explained to her. She needs just another set of rules before she can proceed in the conversation. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Talk about the awkward conversation that if, you're the, if you are just the bystander, you want to try to figure out how to get out of as soon as you can. Here's, here's her next statement. Life is challenging can you protect me from the heat? Life is challenging. Anyone think that life is challenging? Life is challenging. Uh, and so if we think that life is challenging, go to Europe and see how challenging life is there. Be part of the 1.2 million people who have uh, kissed the men in their family goodbye and said, May, hopefully, we will pray that we will see you again. Um, or about the 59-year-old uh, man this week that walked his six children to the border and left them there because he wasn't allowed to leave Ukraine because he wasn't old enough. Life is challenging. Life is challenging. And she said, "Can you? life is challenging. Can you protect me from the heat of life? And what she really wants to know is, can you, can you prevent me from having to come to this well every day? I want that water that you have. And, and Jesus says, yes, I can protect you from the heat of life, but I need to protect you from yourself first. Anybody agree? I, I will be the first person in this room right now that would admit I need to be protected from myself. Sometimes life is challenging because I make life challenging. Sometimes I can be the president of the idiot club. And I look back and I'm like, did I really just make that decision? But so can you. And so we'll like take turns wearing the hat of the president club. We need to be protected from ourselves. Life is challenging because we created it. And quite frankly, there is heat in our lives because we made it that way. This lady is going to the well at noon because she went to the well at noon. She's there because she went. She, quite frankly, could have sucked it up and went to the well at 8 o'clock in the morning. She's like, I'll deal with it. But sometimes it's easier to run from our problems than to face our problems. Life is challenging, and so we run, and we create more problems, and life is more challenging. And Jesus says, 
I need to protect you from yourself first. And so he says, uh, I'm going to peel back. Uh, you get a bandage over a scab. I'll just rip that bandage off. That's what Jesus does. Ma'am, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the guy that you currently have isn't your husband. I think it's important. Life is challenging. I think it's important that we talk about what that means. This is not the American uh, view of, oh, I, this marriage didn't work out, so we annulled it, and I went to another. So here's my second marriage, and um, a couple years in, I don't like you anymore, so uh, I'm gonna, you're done, I'm divorced. And the pattern goes on where it is really easy. In the state of Indiana, you can, you can get divorced in 30 days, and you can just file the paperwork online. You never have to see a judge or a lawyer. And so this is not the American, I've had five husbands. This is the, um, in the New Testament, in order to get married, you had to be betrothed, refer Mary and Joseph, Matthew 1. A betrothal, a betrothal is the one-year process before, you, before you're allowed to consummate your marriage. And so this lady had gone through the process of um, being betrothed, married, um, a whole new family, a whole new identity, a whole new life wrapped around this husband. To Now that's not ending. Now I'm going through the whole process again. To that end and, and so on and so forth. And so she has gone through this whole process five times. So this, this, in the worst case scenario, this has affected 10 years of her life. The worst case scenario, she is between 25 and 30 years old. And she's already been in five marriages. And she is at whatever process that she is with this, with this husband. And Jesus goes and just rips the band-aid off. Lady, there's something not right I need to protect you from. Before I can protect you from the heat, before I can care for the fact that life is challenging, we have to talk about some other things. You go back to uh, the group that is forcing her to go. Uh, she's there because she doesn't want... She is at the wall at noon because she made choices that drove her there, but there's also this group of people. Okay, so... I want to just, I want us to understand that if there is this thing in our lives that keep, it keeps coming back, if this same challenge keeps coming into our lives over and over and over again, it's a good chance that we just haven't dealt with something. And, and it could be you're in this room today and Jesus is like, pull back the scab and you're like, no, I want to put it back on. You're like, I, you go to the hall closet and you get a new band-aid and you put it back on and now you get the gorilla tape and you put the gorilla tape around it so Jesus can't pull the band-aid off. In case you didn't know, Jesus is stronger than gorilla tape. And let's just say, guys, the band-aid and the scab is on your leg and now you put gorilla tape on your leg and Jesus comes like, no, we need to deal with that. What comes with it? All the hair that's on your leg, which makes, more, which makes the whole situation more challenging. Now there's more heat. And you're like, no, I think, I think, I think this time I'm going to super glue the bandage on my leg. And it just, we have a way of, of Jesus, I want, you, I want you to fix the challenge, but I'm going to tell you how to fix it. And Jesus says to this lady, um, I, can, I, can, I can protect you from the heat, but I need to protect you from yourself first. Let's talk about the choices in your life that you have been making. Here's the next one. 
verse 19, I, I always find this, this part of, I always find this part of the, the chapter very interesting. The woman said to her, um, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Really? He just told her about her life story. You must be a prophet. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Okay, so here's what she's really saying. Jesus, I want, I want to be a spiritual person. Can we just talk about religion? I... I want to be a religious person, Jesus, but I don't want you to pry into my life very much. Right? We've all been there. I want, I want, I want to be able to say I attend such and such church and I throw my $10 bill in the offering plate and I, I'm, uh, I have my religion, I have my fire insurance, but Jesus, don't pick the scabs. Don't pry. Don't dig too deeply because I just want to be a spiritual person. Let's talk about worship protocols and how my way is better than other people's way. But Jesus, don't go prying. Don't go prying. Don't rip off the scab. That hurt a little too much. I'd like to keep it more than I'd like to talk about it. Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. The day's coming when it's not about the location where you worship. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming. And now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Uh, Jesus, I want to be a spiritual person. Can we just talk about religion? Jesus says, no, I want your worship. I want your worship. I want all of you. I want, I want what is in your spirit. I want what's in your mind. I want what's in your strength. I want everything. Because if you, want, if you want everything that you're looking for, that's what you have to do. That's what we have to do. We have to give God everything. I want your worship. I want your worship. And when we give God our worship, when we give God our worship, um, protocols don't matter. Hymns don't matter. Um, none of it matters. So at about, uh, I, I get here on Sunday morning about 8 o'clock. Um, and I make coffee. And then I come in here and I have church before anyone has church. Like I, I turn on my worship playlist and I crank it. Um, good thing we have good speakers because I would probably blow them if they were not. And, and I just... I, just, I sit in this room and I get on my knees in the middle of that aisle and I just worship God. Because if, if I want you guys to walk into this room and worship, I have to do it first. And I, I was praying this morning, God, fill this, fill this room with the Spirit of the Lord before you fill it with people. Because I never, I never want us to just be spiritual people. I never want us to just be religious people. I want, I want us to be overwhelmed by the worship, by worshiping the living God. Which is what this lady had to learn. Let's talk about where we're supposed to worship. No, let's just talk about worshiping. Let's just talk about worshiping. Let's talk about, let's get right and let's get focused on worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ for who He is. King of kings, Lord of lords. Sovereign over all. Yes, that means I'm not going to understand a few things about life, but that doesn't matter. God's in control. Here's the last one. Verse 25, The woman said to Him, 
I, I know, you know, so you, you start talking about worship and people automatically go to like um, their personal preferences. I've been in those conversations over and over. So this lady tries to avoid talking about worship. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Translation, he's going to tell us who's right. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I'm waiting for the Messiah to show up. Will he fix everything in my life like I expect him to? Will he fix everything in my life like I expect him to? I love I love Jesus' response. I who speak to you am he. Everything that you have been looking for, Miss Woman at the Well, is standing right in front of you. I would love to fix everything in your life. I might not do it the way that you expect me to, but I'm going to do it the way that's best for you which is not always the same. And Jesus says, I'm here. I'm here. We started this conversation with you being a woman who came to the well at noon, running away from your problems. And we've had this conversation, and at the end of it, Jesus simply says, I'm here. I'm here. The application for all of us is whatever whatever you have come in with the, come into this room carrying this morning whatever the scab is whatever the hurt is whatever whatever the things that people are talking about you behind your back whatever the problems or challenges that you are running from Jesus says I am here I have it covered. The compassion that I carry will be extended to you if you will only receive it. And so there might be someone in this room or watching online or listening that um, needs to hear those words. That even though life is challenging and there's just things, people might not like you or there is... Uh, a message going about you that is inconsistent or untrue. Jesus is here and Jesus has it covered. Okay, but there's also another message for those of us in this room that are believers. Um, don't be the group of people that forces people to leave your presence. Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a message that they need to hear. You have the same Holy Spirit that allows us to have compassion-filled conversations. Even how hard it might be. I have to work at it. There are just some times that I have to work at compassion-filled conversations. I know that about myself. It makes me aware to be more intentional about it. But I also know There are people that need my compassion even when I don't think they do. And if I'm ever going to get to the gospel with people, if I'm ever going to get to the point to say, Jesus is here, Jesus can take care of that, I have to be compassionate. And so, uh, there's room for you in that as well. So I want to ask you, um, are you aware Are you aware of the trigger points in your life that might make you not such a compassionate person? Are you aware of them? If you are aware of them, then I want to um, 
challenge you to write them down somewhere where you can every now and then see them and you can ask the Holy Spirit to change those things in your life. But you also have to give uh, the Holy Spirit permission to pull off the band-aid, which is the part that none of us want. But I want to ask you this, and then I'll close. Is, is the band-aid being torn off your life worse than you watching a friend of yours dying and going to hell because you wouldn't tell them about Jesus? You didn't want to suck it up enough to share the good news of Jesus and let Christ do his work in your life so he could do work in another person's life. Compassion-filled conversations allow believers to have gospel-pointed conversations. If you never or rarely have gospel-pointed conversations, it, it is, I want to invite you to evaluate how often you have gospel-filled conversations.